With a single drop of ink for a mirror, the Egyptian sorcerer undertakes to reveal to any chance comer far-reaching visions of the past. This is what I undertake to do for you, reader. With this drop of ink at the end of my pen, I will show you the roomy workshop of Mr. Jonathan Burge, carpenter and builder in the village of Hayslop, as it appeared on the 18th of June in the year of our Lord, 1700 and 99. So I finally gotten enough distance from my PhD that I've gone back and started reading a lot of the things that I used to write about all the time, which is 19th century English literature. And I think for a lot of people, their perceptions of this kind of writing are not positive. It probably comes from being forced to read certain things in class, or maybe you've never engaged with any of that stuff that you might find in the classics section of the bookstore. But in order to get the most out of the process, I think it's worth thinking about why it's something we would want to do in the first place, beyond a sense of expectation or obligation. So that's what this video is. It's an argument about why reading old books is a good thing from me and Frederick Jameson. What does it mean to read something historical? To put this another way, how do we engage with the historical text? The American writer Frederick Jameson, in their essay Marxism and Historicism, had some really interesting answers to these questions that I think provide some extremely compelling reasons why reading old literature is well worth pursuing. The first thing we have to realise is that we never come to a text and see it as it were for the first time. Just by dint of who we are and the world in which we live, we bring to bear a whole host of different ways of seeing that will inevitably impact how we understand and engage with a book the first time that we pick it up. A couple of common examples to explain what I mean. We could classify these as reading in common and reading which emphasizes difference. So in the first type, we could say that the historical text is essentially analogous to our own time and experience. Shakespeare was the first rapper. However, if we do this, we're left with a kind of nagging and unshakable doubt that if, if everywhere is like now, then we haven't really gone anywhere. When we read, we haven't really encountered anything that we didn't already know in some regard. And so to say that the historical text is analogous to the present is to kind of raise the question of why would we bother reading it in the first place. Furthermore, this threatens to erase all difference. It's a totalizing move, which flattens all of history into a homogenous, bland now. On the other hand, another really tempting tool is to emphasize the essential difference of literary history. So not only are we nothing like the villagers of Hayslop, we have no way of understanding them because the gap between us and them is so vast as to be unbridgeable. The advantage of this is that it preserves the particularity and differences of literary history, but once again we find ourselves trapped in the same place, trapped in the present, unable to understand anything that happened in the past. We haven't really learned anything, and if you commit to the idea of a radical difference, literary history becomes completely inaccessible. These two positions are really easy to apply and maybe even intuitively attractive, but they inherently limit how we engage and understand texts from the past. Is there a better way then that we might bridge the gap between the present and the past that we encounter on the page? Might we find a way of thinking and engaging with these texts that doesn't erase all of the differences and distinctions, but doesn't put us on one side of a chasm so vast that we could never hope to get over it? Is there a better reason for reading old books? Jameson points out that these two positions, the past as analogous to us and the past as alien to us, are deeply ideological. 
What I mean by that is that we tend to think of our ways of reading as lenses through which we can see the text more clearly. However, in many ways, these lenses actually make it harder for us to engage with the thing that we're trying to read. However, the point is not to come up with a non-ideological way of reading, but to begin from the point of recognizing that every encounter with the past will always be mediated by an interpretive scheme of some sort, what Jameson would call a political unconscious. I won't focus on all of the positions that Jameson outlines in his essay, which I'll link below, but wanted to bring attention to two in particular, two different kinds of historicism, existential and Marxist historicism. Existential historicism is described by Jameson as a particular method of dealing with historical objects. It's marked by a sort of aestheticism that lends itself to careful attention to what we're, what we're engaging with and a deep appreciation of it. In this way of thinking, the past becomes a source of great aesthetic engagement and excitement. However, to stop everything that we engage with becoming just a list of names and characters and places and dates, there has to be a kind of structuring narrative that gives everything shape. As Jameson argues for existential historicism, this is the infinite potentialities of unalienated human nature. In the historical text, we see a glimpse of human nature in a brand new way. And what this means is that these objects and texts from the past have huge significance, cognitive and even emotional power that Jameson says has to be honored. The other answer is, of course, Marxist historicism. And what makes this different from existential historicism is that it grounds itself in something a little more structured than just the libidinal and aesthetic appreciation of the literary past. You see, Marxist literary analysis doesn't tell a particular story about human nature, but grounds itself in the structure of the present. I want to quote a long section from towards the end of the essay that Jameson writes, which I think makes the point quite beautifully. First, we must try to rid ourselves of the habit of thinking about our aesthetic relationship to culturally or temporally distant artifacts as being a relationship between individual subjects. As in my personal reading of an individual text written by a biographical individual named Spencer or Juvenal. It is not a question of dismissing the role of individual subjects in the reading process, but rather of grasping this obvious and concrete individual relationship as being itself a mediation for a non-individual and more collective process, the confrontation of two distinct social forms or modes of production. We must try to accustom ourselves to a perspective in which every act of reading, every local interpretive practice is grasped as the privileged vehicle through which two distinct modes of production confront and interrogate each other. Our individual reading thus becomes an allegorical figure for this essentially collective confrontation of two social forms. What's so striking about this is how it makes reading something so significant. More than just a personal choice or cultural enrichment, as valuable as those things no doubt are, it makes personal consciousness a site in which two parts of history can be viewed in microcosm. Secondly, as Jameson goes on to write, this opens up a dialectical relationship between the past and the present, between the then and the now. And rather than allowing us to sit and read and judge a past or bygone age, this mode of thinking opens up the present to the judgment of the past. The past, that radically different mode of production, imposes a painful knowledge upon us of what we are not. The existential historicists are right that the past meets us on the page, but this is about more than just uh, aesthetic appreciation or cultural enrichment. When we understand the historical narrative as a site in which two social totalities can meet and come together, we're made aware of the fact that the past judges us remorselessly. 
staging this encounter between two modes of production, between two modes of life. There is the possibility in some senses for us to consider new ways of life too. So what this does is it opens the door onto what Ernst Bloch would call the spirit of the utopian, or in other words, an encounter with the future. Reading historical texts does not just show us what we were or even what we are no longer, but as with the negative of a photograph, it reveals what we might become. And I can't think of a better reason of trying to engage than that.